Average rate of change is what we're starting with. The average rate of change is one way to describe how a quantity changes over some interval. Average rate of change is given by that slope formula right there. When we say average rate of change, what do we mean? Average rate of change means slope. I'm going to be a little bit more specific here. It's the slope between two points. Average rate of change, you need two points. That's the only slope you know right now, but later on we're going to know other types of slopes. So right now we're going to say it's the slope between two points. It's old school y sub 2 minus y sub 1, x sub 2 minus x sub 1. So part A asks us to find the average rate of change in temperature between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m., and we're going to include units. So we're using that little table down there. Find the average rate of change from 2 to 6, and then do part B where it asks you to interpret the meaning of that answer. Take a second with your neighbor and figure that out. Brianna, what did you start off by doing here? X sub 2 minus X sub 1, good. So she's using this point right here, that's 62 and that's 6 p.m. And the 80 and the 2. So she went with 62 Y sub 2 minus Y sub 1, over. Cool. She set that up. She did slope formula. 62 minus 80 is negative 18. 6 minus 2 is 4. We can reduce that to negative 9 halves, but we're talking about degrees, so it kind of makes sense to go decimal, so I will here. Negative 18 divided by 4 is negative 4 and a half. Negative 4.5. Good. That's the average rate of change. It did ask us for units, and sometimes kids get really nervous about units. Just look at what's going on. On top, we used 62 minus 80. That's the darkest color ever. Uh, 62 minus 80. What do those 62 and 80 represent in units? Degrees. degrees Fahrenheit. So it's degrees Fahrenheit on top. And on bottom, it was 6 minus 2. What were the 6 and 2 representing? So it is degrees Fahrenheit per hour. That's the unit. So negative 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. Anybody want to take a shot at an interpretation here? Cameron, what you got? Okay. All right. That uh, there's some good. Uh, okay. So I would say that we're still missing a, the key component to that. There's one thing up there that's the most important. If every hour it decreases four and a half degrees, what happens a thousand hours from now? What's the temperature of that room? On the interval is important because it's not forever. This average rate of change is a very specific time. And so you need to start off this question. Anytime we do a question like this when we're interpreting, you better tell a time. And so from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. We're just interpreting. We don't have to get super fancy. What class is that for that you're getting super fancy for? Stats? You guys got super fancy there. The temperature... The temperature decreased or decreases negative 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. You don't have to do a whole lot more than that. That's perfectly good, except that's completely wrong. Don't write that. What happens if you decrease by a negative? You're increasing. Don't double negative yourself. So just say decreases 4.5 or it says changes by negative 4.5. But that's plenty, all right? That's all you need in calculus. What, three things that are important here. What's the time interval? If you state the time interval, you're going to do well, all right? What happened? The temperature decreased. How do we know it decreased? Because it was negative, all right? And then if you state the units, it pretty much does everything else you said every hour. Yeah, we're smart math people. We don't have to get beyond by saying de degrees, hours per, or degrees Fahrenheit per hour. Make sense on our interpretation there? That's it, all right? Example two says the demand for a particular product is given by D of P equals that equation, items, where P is the unit price in dollars. Find the average rate of change in demand with respect to price between five and seven. Do some units, interpret the meaning. Do that. If I want to find average rate of change, Jack uh, Copeland, what'd you do first to find the average rate of change? Uh, okay, so you plugged in five. You got 340, so he plugged in 5, he got 340, he got one ordered pair, and then what else did you have to do? Uh, 
88. Yep, 288. Good. He's got his two ordered pairs. Once we've got our two ordered pairs, we want to find average rate of change. So, Marissa, what do we do from there? Yeah, just good old slope. And when I do that, it's 7 minus 5 on bottom. I get negative 52 all over 2, or I get negative 26. Okay, that is my average rate of change. It's negative 26, but it asks for units. On top, that 288 and 340, what was the unit on that thing? Items. It is items. It is the demand for the product given by that items. And so it's negative 26 items over, what does the 5 and 7 represent? The price, dollars. So if I wanted to interpret this thing, somebody want to take a shot at interpretation? Tommy, what do you think? From $5 to $7. That good, sounded good. From $5 to $7, the demand decreased by 26 items per dollar. Boom, done. That's it. I didn't say decreased by a negative. The demand went down. Does it make sense that when you raised the price, the amount of that people wanted went down? Yeah. Every When you increased it by a dollar, 26 less people wanted to buy it. When you increased it another dollar, 26 less people wanted to buy it. That's on average. That's not the actual happening, but that was on average. Makes sense with that. All right. On this graph, we're going to talk about average rate of change. And so what I want you to do is I want you to draw the secant line from 1, 1 to 4, 16. Secant line is exactly the same thing as average rate of change. So I've got this point, 1, 1. I got this other point, 416. Draw the secant line and find the average rate of change. Show me with your fingers what was the average rate of change of this guy. Average rate of change was 5. It's 16 minus 1 over 4 minus 1. I get 16 minus 1 is 15 over 3. Cool. The slope is 5. The secant line, the average rate of change, is exactly the same thing as the slope between two points, which is great. But that is an Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 concept. All right, now we're going to get into calculus, so flip the page over. This is the connection that we need to make. So what we did is we found the slope between P and Q. All right, we found that green dotted line. That slope of that line was 5. But that is a slope over the time interval. I want to be more specific. I want to know the average rate of change at a smaller interval. And so we change that Q value. We make it a little bit closer. All right, so now the slope is here. But I want to make it even closer. I want to make that Q dot even closer. So what happens if the Q were right here? Then I've got this line. It's a little bit closer. And I'm going to keep moving it. I'm going to keep moving this dot closer and closer and closer until I have a dot that almost looks like it's exactly on top of the other one. When I do that, this red line right here is not going to tell me the slope between two points anymore. It's going to tell me the slope at one point. And that is what calculus is all about. What we're finding here, not the average rate of change, but we are going to find the instantaneous rate of change. The instantaneous rate of change, it is the change at a single point. It is like when you drive your car and you look down at your car and it says your speedometer is 70 miles per hour. That is your instantaneous rate of change. That is how fast you're going right at that one second in time. You're going 70 miles per hour. One second later, you might be going 72. Your average was 71 miles per hour, but that one moment in time, you're going 72. That's what we're describing here. Instantaneous rate of change is your slope at one point. Or in other words, the calculus word is the derivative. That is what we're building to right now. We're finding the derivative. It's the slope at a single point. What we're doing today is figuring that out using some limits. So 
this equation right here is a fancy little formula. Slope can be found using this limit equation right here. And it looks really fancy. It's not. F of x plus h is like y sub 2 minus f of x is like y sub 1. And then on bottom, it's x sub 2 minus x sub 1. That's it. Let me show you this in a picture. So in this picture right here, you've got this point right here, x and f of x. And then you're going to have this other point that is just like this x value, but we're adding some number h. Like right now, if I started here and went to there, it's like I added 1, 2, 3. It's like h is 3. Does that make sense? So what happens if I move that dot a little bit closer to it? So instead of being at 3, now I'm going to move it to 2 away. All right, that line's a little bit closer. What if I moved it to 1 away? Now it's a little bit closer. Now I'm going to move it even closer and even closer and even closer until this dot is so close to that dot that you can't even tell anymore that there's a difference. What would I be doing with my h value? What's my h value going to be? Very, very small. Almost so small that it's zero. What do we do in calculus when you take something and make it so close to something, it's pretty much that thing. We found the limit. All right. That's what we're going to do here. We are finding the slope formula here. You can see the derivative here a little bit. But we're going to keep moving this thing closer and closer until h is pretty much zero. And that's going to allow us to find it. When we find that slope at a given point right here, like this red line, that's called a tangent line. It's no longer a secant line. It's now a tangent line. Let's show you how to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to find an equation of the slope of the parabola y equals x squared. We're going to find the slope of those three lines, and then we're going to write the equation of the tangent line. This scares kids sometimes when they see y equals x squared. So instead of that, I'm going to say f of x equals x squared. I know. Well, it's going to make it less scary here in a second. Are y equals x squared and f of x equals x squared any different? No. Y and f of x mean the same thing. But it's going to help us when we do this part. All right, so we're going to solve this limit equation. So it's going to be the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h. f of x plus h. We did this back in August. f of x plus h. This is what f of x is. f of x is this guy right here. Originally, it just said x inside the parentheses. But down here it says x plus h. Any guesses on how I can write f of x plus h? It is not x squared plus h squared. It is parentheses x plus h squared. Or in other words, I took the x that was right here and I replaced it with x plus h. That's all I did. I plugged x plus h. Everywhere there was an x in this problem, everywhere there was an x, I put an x plus h in its spot. That's it. Cool. Minus f of x. What am I going to write in for f of x? x squared all over h. Cool. There's my limit problem. Now all I need to do is solve that limit problem. So for any limit problem, how do I find the limit as h approaches 0? Plug it in. I'm plugging in 0. What am I plugging in 0 for? h. I'm plugging in 0 for h. So if I plug in a 0 here and I plug in a 0 there, what do you get? You, in determinate form, you get 0 over 0. Oh, man, I wish I got a number, but I didn't. I got 0 over 0. What happens when you get 0 over 0? What do we need to do? We need to factor, we need to cancel, and we need to plug back in. We need to find the whole. So when I say factor, I, that also implies simplifying. So we're going to start off by simplifying this guy. So we're going to find the limit as h approaches 0. I need to do this thing right here. And so hopefully you are good at that. But if not, I would suggest just memorizing it. x plus h squared is what I need to do. That is not x squared plus h squared. You've got to FOIL it out. If you take x times x, that's x squared, plus xh, plus another xh, plus h squared. That is what x plus h squared is. Or in other words, it is x squared plus 2 xh's 
plus h squared minus I got a minus x squared all over h. I foiled that out and I rewrote it. Everybody go to that point. We are trying to simplify. Is there anything on top that I can now simplify in this problem? x squared. I got a positive x squared. I got a negative x squared. Cool. Those two things cancel out. If you did it right at this point, everything should have gone away that doesn't have an h in it. If you had anything left over that had an H in it, you screwed it up. Is there anything that doesn't have an H in it? Nah, we're good. So what does that mean we can do if everything's got an H in it? Take an H out. And so limit as H approaches zero. On top, both of these things have an H. So I'm going to take an H out. If I take an H out, it's going to be 2X plus H. And on bottom, I'm going to have just an H. We factored. Now we are going to cancel the H is cancel and then we are going to plug it in we're gonna plug it in and so I'm gonna write this in words right now we'll get into notation later but the slope equation the equation that will tell me the slope of my line is gonna be equal to 2x the H went away because I plugged a zero in my slope equation is just 2x. That is the derivative. The derivative of that equation is 2x. Once we've done that, now we're going to do the second part. Now it's asked us to find the slope of the parabola at 1, 0, and 2. Negative 1, 0, and 2. So the slope at x is equal to negative 1 is, I'm writing it out in words right now because later on we'll do it without words. How do I find the slope? Plug it in. I'm going to take negative 1. I'm going to plug it in right there. So 2 times negative 1. My slope is negative 2. The slope at x equals negative 1 is negative 2. The slope at x is equal to 0. What's my slope at 0 going to be? 0. Because I'm plugging 0 into this equation. It goes away. And then my slope at x is equal to 2. The slope at x is equal to 2 is going to be 4. That's what we just found, and I will show you in a picture in two seconds what that means. Just believe me right to this point. Everybody good to there? Let's do the last thing that asks us to do. Write the equation of the tangent line at x is equal to negative 1. Anytime I ask you to write the equation of a tangent line, what are you going to do? Point slope. Write the Mad Lib. Okay, the point slope. Y minus x minus. I had it all pretty. What do I know to write the equation of the slope at x is equal to negative 1? What's my x value going to be? Negative 1. And so I can make this minus a negative 1, so it's going to be plus 1. My y is 1. How do you know your y is 1, Jack? We plug it into this equation. When you take negative 1 and you plug it in right there, you get 1. So our y value is 1. And what's my slope going to be? Negative 2. That's this guy right here. That is my equation of the tangent line. Let me show you visually what this means. Here is my slope of the tangent line. There is the point. Ah, hit the home button. There is the point, negative 1, 1. Would you agree that that blue line that I have drawn in there is a tangent line and that it touches it in exactly one spot and tells you what the slope is at that point? That is the tangent line. There's my equation. Y minus 1 equals negative 2x plus 1. What did we say the slope was at 0? 0. Here's 0 right here. Does it not look like that's my tangent line right there? The slope is 0. It's completely flat on bottom. And then my slope at 2 is that line right there. That purple line that's being drawn has a slope of 4, just like we found on that graph. We found the derivative. It tells us the slope of the point at that graph. Questions? Let's do it again. Flip it over. We'll do one more example. We'll be done. Stay with me. Here we go. We're doing it again. 
Find the slope of the parabola, y equals x squared plus 5x. So we're going to find the limit. Remember, this is the same thing as f of x equals x squared plus 5x. We're finding the limit as h approaches 0. f of x plus h. How do I find f of x plus h given that equation right there? We plug in x plus h. Everywhere there was an x, we're plugging in x plus h. Because instead of x, now it says x plus h. And so it's going to be x plus h squared plus 5 x plus h minus f of x. What am I going to write for f of x? x squared plus 5x. But if you write it like that, it would be all wrong. It needs to be in parentheses. You're subtracting that whole thing, so it needs to be in parentheses. And then on bottom, I'm going to have just h. Foil that out, multiply it in, distribute it out, start canceling, see what you get. Okay, it's just like the last one. It's a little bit tougher, but simplify it out and see what you get. Remember, once you've canceled, you should have everything with H's left. See what you can do. So on top, I had to foil. I foiled this out. X plus H squared, that gave me this guy. I had to distribute this 5 to both parts. That gave me this guy. And then I had to distribute that negative sign. And when I distributed that negative sign, that gave me this right here. Questions with how I got to that point. That's all over h. Right now, if I plugged in h, I would get 0 over 0. That doesn't help me. And so then I need to simplify. Is there anything on top and bottom that I can now cancel? x squared. I've got an x squared right there. I've got a negative x squared right there. Those two things are going to cancel. 5x. I've got a negative 5x right here, and I've got a positive 5x right there. Anything else? So anything else better have an h with it if it didn't cancel out already. Does everything else have an h with it? It better. The limit as h approaches 0. I'm going to factor an h out. So I'm taking h out of that. I've got 2x plus h plus 5. And on bottom, I just have an h left. We factored. Now we are going to h on top, h on bottom. Those cancel. I factored, I canceled, and then I plug back in. I take that 0 and I plug it back in. And I am left with my slope formula. The derivative is going to be equal to 2x plus 5. So the question was, find the slope of the parabola at the point x equals 3. The slope at 3 is what? 11. Because I would just plug 3 in right here. 2 times 3 is 6. Plus 5 is 11. The slope is 11. Part B asks you to write the equation of the tangent line. Cool. I'm writing the equation of the tangent line. Then I'm plugging into that. Find the equation of the tangent line. Dalen, what's something you can plug in here? 3 for x, so it's minus, and my x value is 3, so x minus 3. What else, Nick? 24 for y, how'd you get that? Uh, you plugged it into what? Not the, not the slope. The original equation. If he plugged 3 into that original equation, that will tell him y. And so when he plugged in 3 up there, he got 24. And then my final number, what number goes in front of the parentheses? 11, the slope, the thing we found right there. That is my equation of the tangent line. Questions on something we did today?